Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brandon Hammer. I work at Incorn the Transitional Justice Institute at Belster University. Uh, I'd just like to uh, welcome all of you to the seminar. I'll be moderating today and chairing, uh, but in the background, we also have uh, Kate Turner from Healing Through Remembering, who's also moderating, just helping us uh, with the technology, and also Rory O'Connell from the Transitional Justice Institute uh, as well. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, all of you here with us uh, as part of our Dealing with the Past in Northern Ireland seminar series. Uh, it's an uh, effort from the Transitional Justice Institute, from INCOR, uh, and in partnership with Healing Through Remembering, and also myself, uh, I hold the position called the John Hume and Thomas P. O'Neill Chair in Peace at Ulster University. Uh, and part of what we wanted to do in the seminar series was to really focus on the discussions around dealing with the past in in the context uh, of the conflict and about Northern Ireland. Uh, our aim was really to try and widen the debate. Uh, I think many on this call would be familiar with the Storm and House Agreement and some of the current debates going on, uh, but we wanted to also look at these issues from maybe a slightly wider perspective. Uh, we had originally planned, as some of you have been on some of the seminars before, uh, some 10 face-to-face uh, -face seminars and with the COVID situation we've obviously changed that. Uh, having said that, uh, we've had a fantastic response to the seminars today. We've got about 50 people online. Uh, last week we or last seminar we, we had some 250 people online. So you're all uh, really, really welcome uh, and I hope you'll find the seminar today uh, interesting. And I just want to specifically thank Healing Through Remembering who are a key partner on this on this initiative, uh, which is important to us as we try and reach out to as wide an audience as possible. Uh, the seminar today is going to be given by uh, Dr. Thomas Hansen, who is a lecturer in law at the Transitional Justice Institute in, in Ulster University. The paper is in, entitled, Is the UK Heading Towards Combat Impunity? Thomas asked me to mention this before he starts speaking that his work is specifically focused on a much wider range of issues around accountability and impunity questions in the UK. So his work started in Iraq. So he doesn't see himself as a direct expert on the Northern Ireland context. And uh, what we're hoping is that we'll be able to use this as a springboard and application to maybe the Northern Ireland context. So Thomas just wanted me to mention that as he felt he might not want to speak about the specific details of Northern Ireland, but certainly can talk about the wider context and some of his research on accountability. So that's really all I need to say by way of introduction. I'm now going to hand over to, to Thomas, uh, who will speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we will have time for a question and answer session. And, and thanks to you and, and Katie for inviting me to uh, take part in the seminar series. I, I really look forward to talking about my um, my research about combat impunity in, in the UK and as Brandon says in the introduction, then um, my research sort of originates in, uh, in wider questions around accountability in, in the UK for crimes by the military specifically, more than it um, connects specifically to Northern Ireland. But, but of course, I, will, I mean, I'll be interested in, in hearing uh, comments and, and questions. Uh, about that topic, so so probably I can learn something from today also. Well, so thanks everyone for joining in. I don't really know who exactly is out there and who's listening in, but uh, I guess I will meet some of you later on and uh, when we move to to the discussion. So I think we got about an hour and a half. For this, so now it's it's already a bit a bit past three, but uh, as Brandon said, I will try to to stick to around 30, maybe 35 minutes in the presentation itself. So we have enough time for very interesting discussion after that also. So the presentation, it, it looks at various legal measures that are being proposed in the UK that aim to limit accountability in different ways for violations committed by, by soldiers in military campaigns abroad and in Northern Ireland. So um, as I mentioned, this, this presentation sort of takes a the broad perspective that it looks at, at measures that are being introduced introduced nationally in the UK, not not specifically at at what's going on in the UK. Though, as I will return to later on in the presentation, um, that's quite the overlap here. That a lot of what is being considered 
UK wide will will likely also be introduced uh, in in a similar fashion in, in the North Irish context. So we'll we'll get back to that later. Um, my interest in these questions it really it really uh, started off with a research project by funded by the British Academy that uh, that looked at accountability for war crimes in Iraq by by UK soldiers. So that project sort of took an, an international law perspective looking at this from from what we call a complementarity perspective so whether whether what was being done in the uk if that was sufficient under under the icc statute to not permit the icc to step in um so in that sense i, I looked at those accountability measures both from an international and a national perspective but mainly within uh, mainly within an international legal framework. Um, following that project, I've done a, a bunch of, of follow-up projects, some of them with, with Carla Firstman from Essex, um, where we looked more specifically at the UK's military justice system and um, and later on also specifically at, at the different proposals that, uh, that I will discuss in this presentation relating to statutes of limitation and derogation from the European Convention and, and other measures. So uh, so Carla and I, we submitted evidence to to the Commons Defence Committee on, on this topic some years ago. And uh, and last year, we also took part in uh, in the MOD's consultation process on, on these topics. So we've been, you know, involved in it also very much from a policy perspective you will um so a, a bit of, of context before i go into this so what is what is really going on is that the uk um has for quite some time been considering a bunch of proposals that in, in different way ways seem to aim at um ending or undermining or limiting accountability for for british soldiers who have served abroad and uh, in Northern Ireland. So uh, this is quite a long process, but um, and we have a number of different proposals on the table, uh, including a statute of limitation, a statute of limitations like legislation. We have reform of the UK's own Human Rights Act. We have well connected to that derogation from, uh, from the European Convention. And we have what has been referred to as a civil litigation long stop and other measures that I will discuss in this in this presentation. Um, I should say also at the outset that these these proposals, these suggestions, they originate in concerns about criminal investigations and civil litigation brought in the context of uh, of the war in Iraq. So a lot of this really goes back to concerns among decision makers in the UK that a lot of litigation was arising out of the Iraq war and uh, criminal in investigations of, of soldiers involved in that campaign. So uh, that is where it sort of started. But of course, it also goes to an even longer debate about accountability for for crimes in, in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think I think in my view, it's important that we we look at what is currently going on, that we look at government's um, action and inaction more broadly relating to issues of accountability for the military. So uh, just three points to briefly mention at this point, and I will get back to it in, in more detail later on. But, but one point is that we have seen quite ineffective, some would say dysfunctional by design domestic mechanisms to investigate crimes committed in conflict zones. So notably I had so the Iraq historic allegation team that was set up to investigate uh, crimes committed by soldiers in Iraq has proven um, rather unsuccessful really so we had a mechanism with with hundreds of, of investigators that has been working for uh, for several years under, under a fairly large budget but uh, nothing has come out of that so the, um, the SPA director Andrew Cayley uh, the service police uh, the Service Prosecution Authority announced just the other day that uh, most likely we will not see 
any prosecutions whatsoever uh, emerging out of, of that process and, and it has seemed like that for, for quite a long time so that is quite puzzling when you think about it that you had several thousand cases being uh, investigated relating in, in one way or another to crimes in Iraq typically uh, relating to ill treatment of, of detainees or unlawful killings and not a single of those cases will assumedly lead to uh, to prosecution so so that is something to you know think about uh, secondly we've seen what i would frame as opposition uh, possibly even a level of hostility towards the icc process so the icc the international criminal court currently has a what is known as a preliminary examination of of the situation in, in Iraq. So that specifically focuses on the conduct of UK soldiers. So that examination of the situation in Iraq is, is limited to uh, asserting whether UK soldiers committed crimes under the ICC statute. So, so war crimes uh, during the Iraq war and, and occupation. And as you can imagine, UK authorities are anything but enthusiastic about being scrutinized in this way by an international court and something that could, you know, potentially, th theoretically at least, lead to uh, to accountability for, uh, for high-ranking military officers or, uh, or decision makers in the UK. So the UK has taken uh, a number of measures to try to, um, well, at least make it very clear to the ICC that they do not think this is a good idea. So they've been pushing for quite a while in, in different ways to see that examination terminated. And if you listen to to what Andrew Kelly just said when he came out the other day, he sort of said that he expects that the ICC will not be pursuing this any further. And, and we've, we've yet to see a uh, a decision by the ICC that that this examination has been going on now for for quite a number of years, and it has been uh, well. Last year, the office of the prosecutor said that it would likely very soon make a final decision whether to proceed to a full investigation. But we're still we're still waiting for that decision, even if it is now June 2020. So, uh, uh, but let's 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 see what will come out of that. And then, uh, thirdly, attacks the legal profession and human rights advocates. So this is something where we'll give you a, a few more examples later on in, in the presentation, what exactly is. But just to say for now that uh, that certain authorities have taken a, uh, a quite harsh stand against the lawyers and, and the human rights advocates that have been pushing for accountability and uh, legal proceedings have been been brought against certain law firms and, and sort of a arguably a broader campaign against against these folks that's quite uh, quite troubling really from a rule of law and, uh, and human rights uh, perspective <clears throat> um, so before I, I go more into the details with the different proposals that are actually on the table right now I just want to briefly outline the process and I, I won't bore you with all the details of this but uh, sort of essentially this goes back to 2014 when uh, when the Commons Defence Committee conducted a major inquiry into UK armed forces personnel and the legal framework for uh, for future operations concluding that the armed forces and and the Ministry of Defence faced an unprecedented number of legal cases a, a rise driven by the number and nature of the conflicts that the UK forces had been engaged in during that period growing use of challenges under human rights law in UK courts. And that's important to note that last quotation because that is sort of what has, you know, been emerging out of this over the last couple of years that there is a huge annoyance among uh, within the Ministry of Defence and, and more broadly in, in what you could maybe call the pro-military establishment that human rights law uh, applies to to armed conflicts where the UK takes place has brought with it a lot of of litigation. So that's that's one key area of concern among um, well among many decision makers in in in, in London that uh, uh, that human rights law really permits for this kind of, of litigation in, uh, before UK courts and before uh, before the European courts. So so that's that's an important point. Then in 2017. 
the Defense Committee published another report called Who Guards the Guardians, which concluded that I had. So the Iraq historic allegations team that I spoke to before was unfit for purpose, has proven deaf to the concerns of the armed forces, blind to their needs. Uh, record closed, which then very soon afterwards, I think a few months after the Defense Committee had recommended its closure, the Ministry of Defense announced, announced that it would be uh, be closed down and replaced by a, a smaller but really quite, quite similar body. And it also demanded that the government enacts a statute of, of limitations. Moving on then to, to June 2018, um, the Defense Committee launched a new inquiry into the question of how former service personnel can be protected from the spectra of investigation and reinvestigation. Um, and in May 2019, the Defense Secretary at the point uh, announced that the government would make a series of proposals to provide for what she called stronger legal protection against prosecution for, um, for current and former service personnel, including what was then uh, referred to as a presumption against prosecution for battlefield related crimes and I will um, speak more in just a few minutes about what what the presumption against prosecution really is. Uh, and then most recently in March this year the government produced um, what is called the overseas operations bill. It's, it's gone through its first reading in, in parliament now but the second is still pending and um, and just to say that I think had it not been for everything else that has been going on, this, this, well, the introduction of this bill would probably have received somewhat more attention, but it has received uh, surprisingly little attention uh, among commentators and the media and, and others. So um, hopefully something, something will, some more attention could come out of, of this presentation perhaps. Um, anyways, turning to the proposals, so we have first what I call a statute of limitations like proposal. So that has been formulated either as a qualified statute of limitation, which was supported by the defense committee or a presumption against prosecution, which was supported by, uh, by the ministry of defense. And the March 2020 bill um, moves towards the presumption against the prosecution. So not, it's not being referred to as a statute of limitations, but but as we will hear about in many ways, it would probably have quite similar effects to a um, to a statute of limitations. So importantly, that assumption uh, covers a five-year period, basically meaning that any crime by the military committed overseas or any suspect a crime by the military committed overseas that happened more than five years ago that the very clear starting point is that uh, such a crime cannot be investigated by UK authorities uh, subject to a number of, of modifications. Um, and it also does not cover Rome statute crimes which is quite uh, quite notable and in a sense it's positive. I don't think when well, looking at some of the earlier proposals they did not exclude uh, international crimes and Rome statute crimes from from the presumption so that's a positive development that they're not included. I'm not sure how significant that really will be in practical terms because quite often you would see uh, some of these crimes being prosecuted or uh, well investigated and prosecuted under with reference to UK law more than with reference to international law. So the practical difference might not be necessarily be that significant depending of course on on how investigators and will pursue this in, in the future. Um, so I think that's quite deliberate that they excluded Rome statute crimes. There's been, you know, commentators had had noted on earlier proposals that if they did include that, I think uh, very likely the ICC would have reacted to that in, in one way or the other if, if that was in effect covered by a statute of, of limitations. So uh, uh, quite deliberate, I'm, I'm sure that, that it wasn't included. And, and of course also with reference to the ongoing examination of, of the situation in Iraq where UK authorities are still not aware what will be the outcome of that. <clears throat> um, secondly, we have seen a proposal to derogate from the U European Convention on, on Human Rights and, and really this has been quite a long debate in the UK that 
uh, that various governments over over the last many years have have you know in different ways talked about the need to get out of of the European Convention or at least to uh, to derogate it from it in in times of armed conflict and sort of what the Defense Committee hinted at is that they would like to see a standard derogation for for any one for any armed conflict that the UK was a party to but. Uh, I think most commentators agree such a standard derogation wouldn't really be permissible under the European Convention. So probably that's why uh, the March 2020 bill instead says that there's a requirement for the Secretary of State to consider on a concrete basis whether it's appropriate to derogate from certain rights in the Convention. So uh, of course that's that's positive, you know, that it's not a blanket derogation, that it does need a case-by-case -case analysis as is required on the, uh, on the Convention itself. And, um, and also this seems to be in many ways, I think, quite symbolic because if you do look at the kind of claims that are come out of uh, of the conflicts that the UK have been a party to, then uh, most of those they relate to rights that you cannot that you cannot derogate from, that you cannot make except to in any ones, namely uh, torture and other forms of ill treatment and unlawful killings. So the practical effect of, of any derogation might not necessarily be be that significant. So just to just to mention that. <coughs> um, Third, we see a proposal to amend the US Human Rights Act. Um, and again, that has seen various formulations over time. Uh, what the March 2020 bill does is that it will amend the Human Rights Act by introducing an absolute six year limitation long stop for claims under the Human Rights Act with respect to overseas military operations. And it will severely restrict the court's ability to extend time limits, which is quite disappointing and quite a serious question really if you look at it from the perspective of victims because uh, had, had this been in place then it would have meant that uh, many of the claims arising out of the war in Iraq and, and other conflicts but mainly Iraq would not have been um, it would not have been possible to to bring them before UK courts and if this bill is passed then it will no longer be be possible in effect. Closely related to that, there is what is called a civil litigation long stop, um, so whereby legislation should be introduced to restrict, restrict UK courts' discretion to extend the normal time limits for bringing compensation claim, uh, claims for personal injury or death for events occurring outside the UK. And again, the March 2020 bill introduces an absolute six-year limitation for such uh, for such claims. So again. This seems pretty far-reaching, really, from the perspective of access to justice of uh, of victims in, in these conflict zones. Lastly, it has been proposed that a new partial defense should be adopted, whereby pers service personnel would would see convictions for murder reduced to manslaughter in certain circumstances. Uh, well, those circumstances, according to the proposal made by the Defence Committee were, were really quite far-reaching. Uh, fortunately, the March 2020 bill did not include any uh, any provision for such a for such a, for such a defence, which would have been uh, very problematic, I think, from a rule of law perspective. Very briefly, how do these proposals then apply to Northern Ireland? Well, first of all, it's clear that the bill as such does not apply to Northern Ireland because it applies to operations of the armed forces outside the British Islands. So uh, that being said, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on the same day that the bill was introduced in Parliament uh, may gave a written statement where he said that they were aimed to ensure equal treatment of Northern Ireland veterans and those who served overseas. So. If you check that statement, it, it's saying that the ambition, the objective is to make sure that everything that's covered in this bill would also apply uh, in the same manner to uh, to Northern Ireland. <clears throat> um, so that was sort of an overview of, of what's going on, what's what's on the table, uh, what does the bill say, and how far are we in, in this process. Now I'll try to, to dig a bit into how to understand these measures. So uh, 
I think maybe a useful way of framing it is to ask, is this a question of lawfare or is this a question of war and law? So the former Secretary of State for Defense, she labeled this in one of in one of the reports by the Ministry of Defense lawfare. So basically saying all this human rights litigation coming out of of Iraq and other conflicts where the UK um, has been involved is really sort of a question of left wing human rights lawyers making money out of this. It's very uh, it's very frustrating because there are no merits in these claims and it, it really stresses the service personnel to have this uh, the threat of litigation and, and of course the Ministry of Defense itself is also very annoyed that they have paid out of millions of um, millions of pounds in compensation because a lot of these claims have been settled so out of court settlements uh, where we don't know exactly what is uh, I mean what has been accepted by 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 the ministry but uh, we do know that they have been paying out of a lot of money. Um, so that that goes with you know the sort of narrative I spoke about at the outset. Uh, this is really a question of I mean there, there are no merits in these claims. So if anything, it was a few rotten apples in Iraq who committed you know a crime here and here, but there was nothing systematic. There were uh, these crimes did not happen on any large scale or wide, uh, widespread fashion. That that. Uh, that the UK had policies in place to ensure that uh, detainees were interrogated in, in manners that comply with uh, the relevant convenience, conventions and so forth. Um, so a huge annoyance really with the lawyers and the human rights advocates and even with the courts that have been involved with this, so including UK courts and, and including the European court. And uh, um, that's been sort of the rationale for, for decision makers in, in London to to move ahead with this. So yes, we have seen uh, quite a significant amount of, of civil litigation. And, and as I just mentioned, a lot of that has uh, has really led to settlements where um, the Ministry of Defense has, has you know, decided to to compensate victims. And um, and how the ministry approaches that is that it, it basically says, you know, we cannot resist these speculative causation claims. So we kind of forced to pay out when they're being brought and, and that does sound a bit puzzling to me and I included here a quote by uh, by Nicholas Mercer who who used to serve as, as the legal advisor to the UK armed forces in uh, the UK army during the Iraq war and he says you know anyone who has fought the MOD knows that they don't pay out for nothing clearly this isn't just one or two bad apples as they have been characterized this is on a fairly large and um, substantial scale so so that's an important argument I think. Uh, also true that we've seen some criminal investigations a lot of the annoyance in uh, in the pro-military establishment has been framed sort of as this is a question of reinvestigation so investigations having been opened and then later on well then closed and then later on reopened and um, if you look at the facts, that's really not true. That only only a fairly small number of these investigations are what you could reasonably call reinvestigations. So most of them are actually new investigations. And even where you have reinvestigations, of course, you can ask what is the question why UK investigators decide that an investigation needs to be reopened? Well. It's got to do with the fact that the initial investigation did not comply with the legal requirements as has been established by uh, by UK courts and the European courts. So, uh, of course, a, a better solution would be to do a proper investigation in the first place, then you would not have to do a reinvestigation. Um, moving back to, to what I introduced uh, to begin with uh, concerning attacks on the legal profession and uh, and the related processes. So I, I include see a number of quotations by, uh, well, first you see former Prime Minister Theresa May saying, we will never again in any future conflict let those activist left-wing human rights lawyers harass, and harass the bravest of the brave, the, the men and women of, of our armed forces. So that statement was made after, uh, well, in the context of um, of civil litigation and, and criminal investi investigations relating to uh, 
uh, to the Iraq war a few years ago. And uh, well, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Dave Cameron also promised to crack down on spurious legal claims and stated that I want our troops to know that when they get home from action overseas, this government will protect them from uh, wounded by lawyers over claims that are totally without foundation. Um, so he's he's assuming a lot here, of course, that uh, all of these claims are totally without foundation, uh, and and many other uh, many other statements have made. You see another one here by Bob Stewart, who who was on uh, the defense committee at at the point, but but it's really been you know sort of a a, a broader campaign by decision makers and. Um, Aspects of the pro-military establishment, if you will, that has that has gone out very hard against the lawyers and the legal processes involved with this, and and a lot of that seems quite troubling from a human rights rule of law perspective. In that, um, you know, you sort of you assume what should be the outcome of of open investigations. You're criticizing very. Um, very heavily the lawyers involved in this and, and you know I, I've spoken to several of the lawyers who who have received death threats and and, and been intimidated in, in many other ways and and I think it's it's fair to speculate that that somehow at least connects to that broader narrative that has been um, that has been devised by the pro military establishment and the act on media outlets in, in the UK. I don't think it's necessary to to name which ones, but uh, but surely certain media outlets have been have been very active uh, supporting that voice. <clears throat> so maybe just just briefly to round off the presentation, um, why is it important to have accountability for crimes by by the military and I tried uh, last night to to come up with a list. I don't think this is an exhaustive list. Uh, there are other reasons, of course, but uh, some of the most important ones, in, in my view, is to well first ensure that the rule of law applies equally to all, and that no soldier is above above the law. So, um, ideally, you would want you know the same standards to apply, if not uh, if not stricter standards, to soldiers who uh, who carry weapons and are allowed to use deadly force under under certain circumstances as to ordinary citizens. Next, effective investigations and prosecutions, they uh, ideally at least promote non-recurrence of crimes by soldiers, so that's that deterrence argument, a preventive argument. Investigations and prosecutions, they make clear that certain behavior will not be tolerated, so that's things you cannot do as a soldier, and um, credibly, credible accountability measures are, uh, are quite important, really, I think, to, to help uh, establish that norm, so it serves sort of an educational uh, purpose, if you will, and and very practically. I mean, one one example could be the use of the five techniques, which many of you will know uh, were deployed in in Northern Ireland, and and the British government accepted that and said that uh, it would not do that again. But then came Iraq, and five techniques were were used again, and uh, uh, well introduced softly, but but quite clearly used, and also in in other contexts. So uh, so that educational argument is is really quite important, I think. Um, of course, timely investigations, they also bring about closure both to the victims and to the suspects. So, of course, I think the perspective of, of victims is very important, but it's also important for soldiers that uh, that investigations are efficient and, and timely. So those uh, who are innocent can be, can be cleared of any suspicion. So that's an argument that uh, in a sense, you know, I mean, that the uh, military itself ought to, ought to support. Um, Importantly, of course, also with the international legal frameworks we have in place now, that if you do not have a functional and efficient um, domestic accountability system, then it increases the risk that you will see your citizens prosecuted um, by the ICC in The Hague. So that is what you could refer to as the complementarity argument. Um, and then sort of on a broader note, accountability is, is important in, in and of, of itself, any country that wishes to be bound by the rule of law. So it's got to do with credibility, it's got to do with that country's image and, um, and standing abroad. And, and, and of course, that also goes with the ability for a country such as the UK to be able to influence international processes and, and uh, uh, and legal frameworks that you do need to have that uh, international standing, of course, to uh, to do that. So, 
uh, to the extent that that you head towards combat impu impunity, it would be it would be rather difficult, of course, for UK dip diplomats to go around the world and say that uh, that other countries to to adopt transitional justice measures and promote accountability for uh, for international crimes. <clears throat> so just to conclude. Um, um, even if some of the most radical proposals are not included in the March 2020 bill, uh, still some of them are quite far reaching from a rule of law and, and human rights perspective. And I think there's a serious risk that they could go under the radar due to other current events. So important for us really to engage this topic, I think. Um, asked when I did a similar presentation last week whether we should view this as something that you know goes to Brexit and sort of a nationalistic agenda and um, what is this really about or is it, does it have to do with sort of a longer uh, tradition perhaps in the UK that that you do not uh, promote accountability for the armed forces and I think there's probably a bit of truth in both I think certainly it's 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 quite important to to keep in mind that historically there's been very very few instances where UK soldiers have been held accountable for crimes committed in uh, well in the context of decolonization of Northern Ireland and, and elsewhere so that's a, a broader than here where, uh, where where probably these current proposals they, they fit in quite neatly though they do seem to depart in the sense that they are well they're not even trying to uh, obscure that this is really about promoting combat impunity so I think typically in the past it has been sort of less transparent but this time it's it's quite clear that this is the objective that we want to make sure that um, that British soldiers and British commanders are not being uh, are not being investigated or prosecuted for uh, for any alleged crimes, and we want to make sure that the Ministry of Defence is not being sued in, in civil suits. Uh, so just to round off with a quote by uh, Maggie Wai, who said that this could well this was said in the context of um, of of the statute of limitations proposal when it was uh, when it was framed. At, in that version, but I think the argument probably I don't know if Kieran is on here today, but uh, but he if if he is, he can maybe tell us if if he would if he thinks that would apply to um, the presumption against persecution that this would put the UK in in the same league as former dictatorships in Argentina and Chile and, and Robert Robert Mugabe's government in Zimbabwe for the UK to join. It's extraordinary, really. So thank you all. Uh, thanks very much, Thomas, for a really interesting presentation, and you supplied us with a lot of detail, a lot of uh, a lot of food for thought, for sure. Uh, I obviously have uh, some of my own thoughts, but maybe I'll I'll hold those off and open up uh, for questions. Uh, so, as I explained to everyone before, the strategy that we'll take is, if you have a question, could you type it into the chat box? Uh, the chat box is open if there are any questions. Fatima had posted a couple of questions, uh, which I think are slightly broader than what you're talking about. But until anyone else starts putting some questions in there, maybe I'll kick off with those. Her first question really concerned the Human Rights Act. She wanted to know if you had any predictions or updates in relation to that. Would ultimately there be some new form of Bill of Rights, perhaps how does that relate to what it is that you were also uh, speaking about? Thanks, thanks for, uh, for the question and for, uh, for passing it on. Um, I mean, it's quite interesting really to note that a lot of, of the frustration, a lot of the irritation among, uh, among decision makers and among the military um, has been directed towards the European Convention and the U European Court, but of course, I mean, uh, your question sort of raises the spectra that the UK has in fact uh, domesticated that that convention for the Human Rights Act. So um, simply sort of uh, leveling the frustration towards Europe and the outside world and international law is uh, a bit uh, misplaced really, because this is also UK law. So uh, if if you are to do a lot of this, you, you not only create uh, you only create a problem from the perspective of international law, but you also bring into question 
issues of compliance with the UK zone legal framework. And uh, to my knowledge, now I must admit that uh, that I haven't found the time over the last uh, the last couple of weeks to really closely scrutinize what's what's going on in in terms of the process. But it's my understanding that. Um, um, the relevant parliamentary committees are yet to uh, to fully scrutinize, well, at least to fully comment on on the bill. So it'll be it'll be well. Hopefully, we'll see some comment from uh, from the human rights uh, committee on, on 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 what's what's the perspective on, on different uh, on these various proposals. And uh, well, will will we see? Will the bill introduces a number of changes to the, to the human rights act? Will we see sort of a a broader reform of the human rights act? Um, I'm not too sure, really, because I think a lot of the annoyance here goes towards rights application to uh, to UK soldiers or more broadly UK citizens abroad. So, uh, at least in this context, what is uh, what is really the annoyance is that human rights law applies to, well, increasingly applies to situations of, of armed conflict, and uh, and that's been sort of you know. The argument by by many of those who have uh, supported these different measures that we have international humanitarian law that governs that governs armed conflicts, so we don't need human rights law to also apply. And um, well, there's a long-standing debate about that. The fact of well, the fact now is that the that certain parts of human rights law at least applies to certain aspects of of, uh, of armed conflict, and and that's you know fairly settled by now by um, um, by UK and international courts. So I don't think I don't think you're going to change that. I don't think we'll see ourselves in a in a situation where human rights law all of a sudden doesn't apply to international armed conflict before. Uh, it's an interesting question also, of course. So what's really the annoyance that human rights law applies to armed conflict when you have many of uh, well when yeah, when you have many of the same prohibitions in international humanitarian law, so torture and other forms of field treatment is prohibited under the Geneva Conventions and other other instruments of humanitarian law, and also prohibited under under human rights law. And sort of, um, I don't want to go into the legal technical details, but sort of overall, it's pretty much the same prohibition. And it covers the same kind of so. So why really be so annoyed with human rights law and not with humanitarian law? And I think uh, probably at least one very important aspect answering that is that human rights law gives victims the ability to litigate. So whereas that's much more difficult under international humanitarian law, uh, requirements to investigate and prosecute are now very clear under human rights law. but the state's obligations are much less clear under international humanitarian law. So, in other words, you're much more likely to see uh, suits and civil suits and investigations being brought with reference to human rights law as opposed to international humanitarian law. So, I think that's you know, that's that's probably one of the main concerns here. What I had said is that Brian Doherty had. Uh, posted a question which I think is, is similar for many people is saying it, it's quite difficult to listen to this without thinking about the Northern Ireland context and considering the 1998 early release scheme and the subsequent on the run letters uh, he asks has an amnesty not effectively been in force in parts of the UK since 1998 anyway yeah uh, <clears throat> well again you know sort of of the technical details of, of, of what has been what has happened in the context of, of Northern Ireland? I think maybe you, Brandon, or you, or you, Kate, would be better placed than me really to comment on that. But but maybe, I mean, my sort of broader comment to to that question would be that what is being introduced here does does look like me a lot a lot like a statute of limitations. So it's not called a statute of limitations. Its effect would seem to quite likely, I think, be the same in many ways and uh, the idea is as, as i mentioned in the presentation to um to include the similar measures for for northern ireland so um that's yet to happen but that that is the stated the stated intention at least mm -hmm. okay so uh Kiefer o'hagan asks this question um has has the uk military taken any steps to reform or change its strategies or tactics 
in regard to military operations or detain detainment procedures to ensure future human rights or international human rights law violations do not occur specifically if they wish to stop legal proceedings have they taken action to ensure that soldiers are aware of their obligations under international humanitarian law and human rights law so yeah i, I think it relates to your your, your comments about uh, you know the lawyers being seen as litigious rather than as trying to enforce something and so she's asking about those changes have there been changes you need to maybe first look at what happened in, in a situation like iraq how was it possible that um, that we seem to have witnessed abuse of detainees at least on a fairly large and and perhaps uh, systemic scale and and um the issue seems to be that, of course, the UK military walked into Iraq without necessarily being fully prepared. So if you speak to, to Nicholas Mercer for, Mercer, for example, who was the legal advisor to um, to the UK army at the point, he would say that uh, th this was a very difficult situation, that, that commanders didn't necessarily know what's going on, what's the expectations, how many prisoners of war are we likely to take. All of a sudden, they found themselves with, you know, thousands of prisoners of war and, and they hadn't they hadn't been planning for that within the history of defense and uh, within relevant units so it was all sort of very ad hoc is the perspective that i'm getting when it comes to to this and then you had you had the legal advisors like like mercer who told the army that uh, you know that you need a convention supply here and uh, there's certain things you do to a person you you detain a person you interrogate and if you ask Mercer he will tell you that he went out and, and witnessed I mean he looked at these detention facilities and told the commanders that uh, you know what's going on here it doesn't look like it complies with the Geneva Conventions really and um, he would then say that he was told by the commanders that um, that's not really any of any of your business Mercer we are we're reporting we're taking instructions from London so don't uh, don't come here and tell us how to treat detainees. So <clears throat> it's an issue I've been trying to understand how, you know, where did this exactly come from? And it seems that, you know, some, the impression I'm, I'm getting, I don't have any sort of, of hardcore evidence to support this, but the impression I'm getting is that there was at some point into this, at least there was sort of a, an approach was, was taken that, um, we do need to go tough on these prisoners, and uh, and uh, we're willing to use the five techniques and 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 other techniques that are prohibited under under international law. And um, and of course, of course, there were no, you know, there were no instructions taught you. Okay. Uh, you don't have a memo saying that that interrogators should torture detainees, but that seems to have been widespread acceptance within the system that it was okay to go very tough on detainees at least. So for me, I also look look separately at, at ill treatment of detainees and the allegations relating to unlawful killings. So I don't think uh, I don't think with respect to unlawful killings that you had, you know, I mean, you got to remember this is also a combat zone so so of course i mean soldiers shouldn't be too trigger happy but but it's also understandable to some level i think that a soldier under a lot of stress being fired at uh, i mean doesn't necessarily go through the geneva conventions before he issues back right so so i think you need to distinguish between treatment and, and unlawful killing here and, and sort of going more directly to your question some has been done since this so um so the, the Ministry of Defense has set up what is known as a systemic working group that has been looking into additional training. So it seems international humanitarian law training um, is better now than it was at the point where uh, where we saw the Iraq war starting. And, and so some improvements in terms of, of training of soldiers. I'm, I'm not sure how much of, of a difference if, if it would make really if, if we saw if we saw a new armed conflict now to on the scale of, of say the Iraq war but um, but certainly the, the the picture I'm getting is that there has been there's been some some improvements in, uh, in that legal training. There's a question here from uh, someone called Claire Simpson, Simmons sorry Claire Simmons and it, it sort of links with what you're saying and maybe it's just putting you a little bit on the spot in terms of the the, the, the list you gave at the end and she's saying 
out of the reasons you mentioned, what do you think is the most effective way to convince the UK government to more effectively combat impunity in these contexts? Is it the threat of the ICC improving their image, first convincing the public and the military that international human uh, humanitarian law isn't the enemy? Um, so it's, I suppose she's sort of asking you, well, what, what do you think is the best way to do this? I know you've spoken about a range of strategies. I certainly would think that, that the argument that this is really in the military's own interest ought to be quite compelling for, for the military and for, for pro-military um, um, people. That uh, If you don't have accountability, the UK's military forces, they, they lose their standing internationally. They, they will be less respected by other countries. So um, again, I'm not a military expert, but as far as I know, uh, I mean, UK forces as such have tend to stand uh, quite highly regarded uh, among among um, among other countries. But of course, if if you create a pattern where they commit crimes that are not being um, where the relevant people are not being held accountable, then then that standing uh, would surely suffer. So I think you know that that ought to be a compelling argument to the military and for those who who take that perspective. I also think that the argument of the ICC ought to be quite compelling, that um, the UK has committed. The UK was a strong defender of establishing the Rome Statute, of convincing other countries to to ratify the Rome Statute. So it's really been a, a driving force behind establishing this, uh, this accountability framework at the international level. So uh, that's important to keep keep in mind. and and. Um, it ought to it ought to be a strong argument in favor of doing this domestically. That you know, uh, being investigated and and prosecuted, or seeing arrest warrants issued for uh, for UK soldiers or UK uh, officials um, from the ICC. So so that's that's a pretty important argument. Claire Hackett has asked, uh, do you think? The lack of accountability in Northern Ireland over an extended conflict has had a consequence for Iraq and other modern conflicts that Britain are now involved in. So she's asking about that cross-border or cross-jurisdictional influence, whether in practice or or law, I suppose. And maybe she's not asking necessarily about the law, but yeah. what what do you think of that? Yeah, right. I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, question. It deserves more attention than... Uh, than what I've been able to to give it in my own research, but uh, I mean, again, back to the five techniques. I think I think that's that's quite interesting that you saw them being deployed in, in Northern Ireland. You saw then uh, UK authorities saying after that that uh, yeah that was that was a bad thing. We or at least we won't do that again. And then uh, uh, you see those practices being introduced in in other more more recent conflicts, including. Including Iraq, so so that's that's quite interesting. And and looking at it from an accountability perspective, of course, you can ask, uh, well, might the situation have been have been different if 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 those responsible for um, for authorizing and implementing those techniques and and well other techniques that that breach international law in Northern Ireland had been held to account and and. Perhaps I'm a little bit naive here, but but I would like to uh, I would like to think that the answer might have been different. That uh, we wouldn't have seen this reintroduction in in Iraq if uh, if that has actually been accountability for what in in the context of uh, of Northern Ireland. Because I had not taken Derek's question earlier, I might just uh, you don't necessarily have to comment on it, but he just posted a a response to Claire's question uh, saying, in his opinion, Britain is, is not alone. All conflict situations from history could be discussed in the same way. America and Vietnam, the church all over the world, and many, many others. It's an unfortunate aspect of being part of the human race. Yeah. So Interesting just, perspective, uh, of course. And, and well, Derek, I mean, I would surely agree that the, the UK is, is not alone. The UK is not the only country that's uh, that's facing some pretty significant challenges, if you will, with with accountability for um, for the military and, and perhaps more broadly uh, law enforcement. And, and the US, of course, uh, quite easily comes to mind, right? Uh, that being said, I mean, at least in a European context, I would say the UK right now does stand out. So you, as far as I'm aware, I don't have all the details, of course, but as far as I'm aware, you haven't seen 
uh, anything coming close to this in, in other major powers, say say France, that also tends to be quite quite active with this military. So um, so if you will, perhaps I mean the U.S. of course was uh, has not been particularly prone to support that accountability actually happens for for war, war crimes either, and and, um, and just to reflect on that, we also have now um, well an investigation. Uh, relating to the situation in Afghanistan that includes uh, that involves US armed forces and um, and the CIA and uh, and that's probably a good reason why uh, why we we see the US and, and the UK being involved in, in these processes that they tend to be very active mil in terms of using their military abroad and 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 they're both seemingly moving in a direction towards some level of, of combat impunity that the uh, I mean, even under under the Obama administration, it was made clear, of course, that uh, that nothing would be done by um, by alleged crimes committed by the CIA. So there was a de facto amnesty, which which again is is I mean equally problematic from an international law human rights perspective. So so yes, the UK is, does not stand completely alone, but but in a European context, it does and quite alone, really. Yeah, and I, and I think that links to a question there, again, from Kiefer O'Hagan, and thanks you for answering the, the earlier question, but this, it links directly to what you're saying. So she said, I wanted to ask about how this combat impunity and possible statute of limitations is able to be defended and proposed by the UK, given the fact that both these aspects are prohibited under the Geneva Conventions and human rights law. Would the bill not effectively be useless at the ICC or other international international bodies. I think that's a very good reason why the UK is not calling it explicitly a statute of limitation, that instead they sort of invent this new term of a, a presumption against uh, against prosecution. Uh, so, so that probably goes very much to the heart of your question that um, we know about statutes of, of limitations. There's, there's a fair level of consensus that the they are not permitted, at least when it comes to to the core international crimes. So, uh, so the UK would really, I mean, surely would have brought itself on on coalition course with 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 various international legal frameworks had it sort of adopted a a blanket statute of limitations. So, um, so so I think that's you know an important factor understanding why it's it's doing something else and also why. As I mentioned in, in the presentation, as as the bill currently reads, at least it does not uh, it does not cover Rome Starship crime. That's important, and in in a sense, it's it's positive or less negative compared to some of the the proposals that had had been tabled earlier on, which uh, did not speak about excluding international crimes. So, a level of progress, but I think that that level of progress goes very much to. Uh, to the fact that that of course you do have good international lawyers being uh, being employed in, in the Ministry of Defence and other relevant departments who uh, who can uh, who can tell um, the folks who introduced the bills that uh, that you you can't just call it a, a statute of limitation and you can't just in, include explicitly international crimes because then you do get yourself into to trouble. So again, the question is if if the difference would be is going to be very big in reality with with that different terminology and uh, and personally I'm not so sure about that because the intention remains the same. Quite simply. Not sure if I completely follow this question, but maybe I'll just read it out and see what you make of it. It's from Terence Wright. If human rights legislation is used as a means of continuing conflict as war by other means, is it legitimate to set a time limit for the pursuit of claims? All right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm also not sure if I completely understand the question, but but the question seems to imply sort of that uh, that this lawfare argument. Uh, Made made by the former uh, defense secretary and others is uh, is sort of uh, the right way to look at it. And um, I mean, my perspective at least would would be quite different. That uh, that uh, that you seemingly have a fairly large number of violations happening in in these uh, conflict zones, and um, the only way for for victims to sort of uh, Get access to justice is uh, is to rely on on this uh, framework for litigation and and remedies that uh, that human rights law provides. So my personal take on it is that uh, 
be quite lucky to have this uh, this human rights law framework that that gives us access access to that and uh, and what by extension also it would be uh, it would be rather problematic if uh, if the UK if the UK is, is seriously is is going to severely limit limit those possibilities as uh, as will happen if the bill is in its current form. Yeah, there's a, there's a comment here from Martin Snodden, which I think is maybe similar. Maybe your answer is the same. Uh, he says, is there a danger that international, I suppose meaning human rights law, maybe international humanitarian law, uh, can be used in pursuit of, because he just put I, IHRL, can be used in pursuit of conflict-related objectives. Right, okay. so I'm, I think I'm, again, I'm not really exactly asked. sure what is meant by conflict-related um, objectives, but but I mean, if if the question is whether these legal frameworks can facilitate the re-engage with issues of accountability in conflict zones, then the answer is yes. And the answer is also that, well, at least for international humanitarian law, it was very much uh, enacted to to exactly ensure that the that the parties to an armed conflict respect certain. Uh, certain basic rules, uh, many of them relating to the protection of civilians and protection of prisoners of war and um, and other people, other persons being um, being in the power uh, in the detention power of another country. So um, so that is the objective exactly because the drafters of those conventions they were aware that. There is a huge risk that uh, such persons uh, in uh, in the detention of, of well, in, within a detaining power uh, power could could be subject to abuse. So it's uh, it's very important to have that protection and uh, and and humanitarian law does a, a decent job, I think, in terms of, of setting out the details of that protection. But it doesn't give us all the details on how to pursue accountability when something goes wrong, which is why we saw the establishment of international criminal law, really, that uh, which is sort of a framework that facilitates accountability for the most serious violations of, of humanitarian law. And um, in terms of in terms of human rights, I mean, this is a long debate and it, it goes, I mean, it goes a long time back. But, uh, but if we are to just uh, sort of describe how the situation is right now, then it is clear that um, human rights law does apply whenever someone is seen to be within the jurisdiction of a party. So someone being uh, being held in detention, for example, would, would seem to be within the jurisdiction of, of the detaining power, and hence human rights law would, as the clear starting point, apply to that. And uh, and uh, again, my view is that uh, that is that is certainly a positive thing because, well, first of all, it sets it sets some some limits on how you can uh, you can treat the people you detain, but it also facilitates that um, the different forms of accountability and remedies can be pursued whenever those rules are not fully respected. I don't want to put words in Martin or anyone's mouth because it's a bit of a difficult means of having a conversation when one person's typing and another person's interpreting. But but knowing a little bit about Northern Ireland, I mean, maybe the issue that's being raised is is the sense of how what you're talking about, how does it relate to sort of state actors versus non-state actors? Um, so in the Northern Ireland context, you might have some people saying, oh, well, if you pursue this type of an approach, you're generally aiming at state actors, which is a way of following a certain perspective of the conflict you know if you know what i mean so maybe that's what's a little bit behind some of those those comments and forgive me if i got that wrong uh, for those who are listening but but maybe more broadly you know how does what you're talking about relate to state and non-state actors uh, or is that not something you you really focus on it is indeed something that that i focused on in my own research and in the in the submissions we we did to the commons defense committee the, we've raised it as a, as one of our key arguments really that it is uh, Huge, hugely problematic from a rule of law perspective to introduce legislation that um, that covers only certain categories of people. So in this case, um, the military really, and uh, and so so I would sort of uh, fully agree with the the sentiments behind the question, if if I understand them com correctly, that uh, that this is uh, this is quite problematic to introduce. Uh, the kind of legal protection for for competence only of members of of the armed forces only, and I, I can certainly certainly see how 
uh, how that that could be perceived and from I mean in Northern Ireland as as being uh, very problematic from from the point of, of view that that I think you have to in your question. So I would I would uh, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, and Martin added there while you were talking. You know, how does this apply to non-state actors who maybe not signed up to any international laws or, or other types of, of bodies? The bill, as uh, so it is currently formulated, applies only to state actors. It applies only to members of the armed forces who served overseas. So, uh, so, so that's important. I mean, uh, uh, if you speak more broadly about the legal frameworks, then international uh, humanitarian law applies equally to state actors and non-state actors. So. Yeah. So, a, so an armed group that's that's you know an unstate actor would would be would be bound by the rules of international humanitarian law even if it hasn't consented to uh, to international humanitarian law because that's sort of how inter international law more generally operates that it is the state that consents to it and then whatever it consents to can bind you know different actors within within this country so there's nothing really. I mean, special about humanitarian law in that sense, but but of course it's important to know that that the legal frameworks also apply to uh, to non-state actors. There, there, there's quite a specific Northern Ireland question here from Mel McConville, who's one of our former MSC uh, Peace and Conflict students, and I'm not I'm not sure it might be too specific for your research, Thomas, but he says uh, if applied to the Northern Ireland context, and and you've already explained this is outside of that but if it was applied to the northern ireland context uh, would it have ramification what ramifications might this have on the definition of who is a victim of the conflict it's, it's interesting of course i mean uh, and 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 it, it goes to many of those deep questions in, in the northern ireland context i mean uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if the bill of such would have any i haven't seen any arguments about that they might be out there but whether it would have any direct impact on who's, who's understood to be a victim, but but if you do read sort of the statement that was given by uh, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, you see, I think I included one of one quick presentation, but sort of the picture that comes out of it is that they're saying, uh, I mean, we committed to the rule of law, but let's let's forget about accountability. Anyways, it's so it's such a long time ago, so let's um, let's focus on what they call information sharing so so i mean in that sense it 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 would certainly limit access to justice for for victims in in a northern ireland context if uh, if as planned similar measures are being uh, are being introduced in, in northern ireland so that's that's worth keeping in mind surely so you're making reference here to the statement on the 28th of march by the secretary of state where the statement is really introduced from the perspective of having concerns about former British soldiers in Northern Ireland and, and essentially yeah, talking in some cases might be closed. Um, so here's here's the statement that was uh, that was given on the same day that that the bill was was introduced in, uh, in the House of Commons and um, and you see that it's it's sort of I emphasized here it says it's the government's view that uh, that to best meet the needs of all victims and the wider society, we need to shift the focus of our approach to the past. While there must always be a route to justice, experience suggests that the likelihood of justice in most cases may now be small and continues to decrease as time passes. Our view is that we should now therefore centre our attention on providing um, as much information as possible to families about what happened to their loved ones while this is still possible so so sort of you know urging move our attention from issues of accountability to issues of uh, of uh, getting access to information really seems to be the key the key message coming out of this uh, that's that's how i understand it anyways um okay so i think uh, i'm going to start to to wrap up here I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, Thomas. Oh, I mean, I just want to say thank you, of course, to uh, to everyone for joining in, and uh, thanks to those who who had very interesting and, and good questions to uh, to ask. I think there is a lot of questions that ought to be to be raised around these issues. I, I personally think it's uh, it's very important that we that we engage this topic and uh, and keep keep monitoring what's going on and ask the tough questions that need to be asked. So uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah.
Well, thanks very much, Thomas. Um, there is a, a comment which uh, Brian Doherty has put up onto the onto the chat, and so I mean others can have have a look at that. But uh, Brian's really, I suppose, asking the questions at which maybe I should just read it. Maybe that's the easiest, and then others can react to it. I, I don't expect you necessarily, Thomas, to have to react to it. But we shouldn't underestimate the impact of one-sided narrative or pursuit pol uh, or pursuit of pursuit policy has on good relations in Northern Ireland experience from the historical inquiries team to the historical investigations unit has provided a perception of who shouts loudest chronology and hierarchy of victims, particularly as many serving and ex-military uh, still make up mainly the Protestant Unionist loyalist community uh, in the province. This is compounded by the lack of an effective voice for the sector. At what point do we draw a line under this? Um, which I guess I mean you don't need to necessarily address the, the detail of that, but I guess that's a that's a core question at the heart of your research in some senses, and you're critiquing the attempts to maybe try and draw some lines. I'm I'm not sure if you want to make a final comment and then we can wrap it up. Interesting, of course, and uh, and uh, I suppose there's a reason why these investigation investigations in the UK are always being referred to as uh, as historical investigations or historical teams. This is uh, this is something of, of the past. This is um, something that, uh, I mean, if you buy into that narrative, something you uh, you better just uh, uh, forget about accountability. At least it's it's no longer relevant. And uh, of course, there are, you know uh, there are the issues that make it that can make it quite difficult to investigate and prosecute crimes that that happened many years ago. I mean, uh, forensics, evidence, and, and all of that. You name it, right? So so. But surely some practical concerns so from a moral point of view i don't think in my my own take on it is that um, i mean the state's responsibilities do not disappear over time that uh, that that the state is and should remain responsible even after years have passed for very serious violations of international human rights law and and humanitarian law, and um, in a sense, this is uh, this is the notion that international criminal law, at least, is is built around that uh, that we, I mean, we don't accept time limits for uh, for these kind of, of crimes that are so serious that uh, that they should be investigated and, and prosecuted, and if guilty, punished. Also, also even in situations where where many years may may have passed since they were they were committed. You know? And you're quite clear also in your research that it feels that the UK is now also deviating from the European standard and approach on much of this, or trying to deviate. Yeah, right. It looks like that. I mean, uh, the, the the requirements to investigate and prosecute under the European Convention, uh, these these uh, the most serious violations. Again, they do not uh, they do not just vanish after a couple of years, right? So it's so it's something new, surely the the UK is trying to do and. And and the effect, of course, uh, also looking ahead, that uh, there's a reason also why why this litigation coming out of, of conflict zones quite often only happens uh, uh, well a long time after the violations happen, because typically it's it's very difficult to pursue litigation and get access to lawyers and all of that while uh, while the conflict is still ongoing, right? So uh, so that's sort of, you know one very important practical argument, I think, why you know. That that there can be very good reasons that we don't see this uh, this this litigation coming until uh, maybe maybe some years have, have passed since uh, since the violation took place. So that's that's important to keep in mind from a from sort of an an access to justice perspective. I would say. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Thomas. I won't ask you any more questions. And uh, even though this is a very different platform and it's not face to face, I know it's pretty tough having to sit there for nearly. 40 odd minutes, 45 minutes getting questions at you and, and having to think uh, on your feet. So I really appreciate that. And I found it really, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it, Brandon. Yeah. And I found it really interesting. And to me, it feels a bit like, you know, having one's own personal human rights lawyer at the other end of the line and being able to ask them whatever complicated, difficult question you would like to ask them. So uh, I really appreciate that. I think it was a, a fantastic addition to our our series. I am going to ask uh, Kate Turner from Healings Remembering just to make some some final 
final comments. Um, I'll also put a couple of comments up in the chat box for those who are listening, any suggestions we might have for the future uh, advertising the next seminar. So Kate, if you're there, do you want to pop in? Thanks very much, Thomas. This is this is very different to what we discussed when we first, first approached you for this series. So um, thank you for, for taking on board doing things in, in such a different way. Thanks to, to Brandon for chairing it and thanks to all the participants, especially those of you who've um, had to come in a couple of times in order to get the sound. Um, but it's it's great to be able to have some kind of debate. Our next in the series will be on Wednesday the 24th of June at the earlier time of two o'clock. The speakers are Claire Hackett, who was one of the participants asking questions today. She's from Falls Community Council and also Healing Through Remembering. And with her is Dr. Catherine O'Rourke from the University of Ulster and the Transitional Justice Institute. They're going to be reflecting on the exclusion of women and gender from the, the dominant approaches to dealing with the past. They're going to look at some specific interventions, possible strategies and approaches. So I hope those of you that are interested can join us for that one. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kate. Thank you, everybody. And we hope to see you again. Uh, thanks for making the time. And thanks again, Thomas, a really great, deeply informative uh, seminar. Uh, and hopefully we see you at the next seminar. So thanks, everybody. Cheers.